sermon. Um, a class begins today in room 103 if anyone's interested. I hope many of you are in learning more about the church, uh, how uh, the church operates, the theology of the Christian church. I'll be teaching that class um, right over here in a room, but 103, and uh, there's donuts and coffee, so, and I don't expect to see Jimmy Love and some there, but, uh, but anybody that can come seriously and really love to ask new people to come if you can. Also, if you're new this morning, this is your first service here, I'd like to have opportunity to meet you, so right down the center aisle to the room on the left, um, we'll go in there and just meet for a minute. This class will begin right after service, but uh, if you're here, I'd like to meet you before I go around to the class, so uh, please feel free to do that. We've got a good-looking group here today, and I want us, we've done this already, but to take a minute to greet each other and just find some people around you and say hello to them now that the choir's come down, and just uh, let's begin our worship with that, our sermon time with that this morning. It seems that everything in our life is much bigger than it probably really is. But it's our life. We're in the middle of it uh, 24-7. And if we really stand back and look, none of us live but a few, few short moments. Scripture teaches us that, reminds us of that. I'm going to argue over the age of the earth, but we're here just for a blip literal blip in all of history and we could call it a pinpoint in time we could call it a pinpoint in location we see and do very little even the most accomplished of people but the scripture asks us to be the best we can to take what God has given us and to be the very best we can we're talking about community we're talking about the church and we, this week, shift from the Old Testament to the Gospels and what they say about the church. And I'll begin by telling you that Jesus only used the word church two times. Obvious reasons was the church was not birthed until after his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We know the birthday to be the day of Pentecost. But our Savior... Literally, our hero, we would say today, only made two statements about the church, but he was looking forward to what it would be. In the first one, Jesus was talking to his apostles. Others had left him, and Fuller was following. But Jesus wanted to know from them who they believed him to be. He had asked them a simple question, who does everybody else think I am, and they gave him some answers that were nowhere near accurate. They talked about him possibly being Ezekiel or some other great prophets that had come back from the grave. 
because of the things he taught and he said was in such agreement. But then he turned to them and said, Who do you say that I am? This is recorded in Mark 16, 16. And they answer this way. Peter did the answer and says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You can read it this morning. And at the end of that scripture, he says, You are Peter. He does a little play with words, the word Petros and Petra. But he says, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The word for church is the word ecclesia, which literally in a short definition means called out, separated. Anytime you look at history, you see where there is a great culture, Rome, United States, England, uh, Germany, wherever there's been great cultures rise and always to fall, the church has always been absorbed into the culture. Jesus tells us it's not to be that way. You are to be the called out. You are to be the people that are different. Peter, based on an individual and a group, a community's belief that I am the Son of God, I will build that group of people that are called out, that are different. I want to read to you this morning before we go any farther I could tell the story there's a couple in the book some of you are reading but to read this one is probably the best way to understand the church it's at the end of a chapter on intimacy in the church and it's a story that Bill Hybels the minister Bill Hybels told it's in a large church and doesn't see people individually uh, to know them all but he wrote that after he preached one weekend, a young married couple approached him. The wife held a baby in her arms wrapped in a blanket, and the couple asked Bill if they would pray for their baby. Sure, he responded, no problem. The mother laid the baby in his arms and then pulled back the blanket to reveal the baby's face. And Hybels recorded that the sight of the baby's face, when he saw the child, his knees buckled. In his arms, he held the most horribly deformed baby he'd ever seen. And the center of her tiny face had caved in. He could say nothing more than, oh my, oh my, in his shock. The mother then spoke up and explained, her name is Emily. We've been told that she has about six weeks to live. We would like you to pray that before she dies, she will know and simply feel the love of her parents. Our love. Hybels prayed for the baby, and he prayed for the couple, and he handed Emily back to her mother, and he said, is there anything we can do for you? Any way that we, as a church, can serve you during this time? We'll come back to the story in just a few minutes with that question. Is there anything we as a church can do to serve you? Jesus said, I'll build my church on a rock. A belief. A belief simply that says Christ is. Every person here is motivated by belief. Let me give you a short term example. Last night, the uh, weatherman said, there may be a little bit of snow on Monday night. And then to whip the crowd into a lather, he said, there may be a big snowstorm coming Tuesday and Wednesday. And everybody perked up. Everybody perked up. Guaranteed their audience for the weather reports. But when we know it's coming, just our belief in the weather, what do we do? We run to the store. We get gas in our car. We begin to complain. I'm sick of snow. I hate snow. The people who are from up north that are part of the church laugh at us. And the people who are in Atlanta panic. Park their cars on the side of the road just to wait for it. <laughs> Belief 
drives us every day of our lives. That's a humorous example. But belief absolutely drives us every day of our life. Jesus said, for those who believe in me, I will build this group, Ecclesia. I saw a church sign a week ago, and I've passed it several times, and the church sign says in very simple terms, today may be the day. Are you ready? Well, let me declare something from the pulpit. Today probably will not be the day. And you probably will have a Monday in your future and a Tuesday. I'm just saying for mathematic reality, don't anybody say he doesn't believe Jesus is coming again. I just have learned from experience over the past six decades it probably won't be today. And I think lots of times we tell the church that and everybody gets ready for this time in the future. But when Jesus was talking about building on a rock, he was talking about the here and now of the people called the church and how we live with each other. The failures we would make and the forgiveness that would or would not be offered. The pettiness we would carry and the love which would respond back to it the sins that would be committed, and the forgiveness that would be articulated. The belief in Christ that would say to us, we're different from everyone else. How many of us would say, I believe in Christ? Let me tell you what you're to believe in. It's found best probably in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It definitely includes death to self in order to become part of the community. And you begin to hear when Jesus is talking these community words that would be applied to the church. Things like, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light set on a hill. You're different. He said things quoting him like, you have heard, don't commit murder. I've had opportunity, and I choose that word carefully, to minister to families right after murders. I have been to the murder scenes. It's the most ugly thing you'll ever see. And I was the guy that for several years would go and knock on the door for a sheriff's department and a police department. One, two, or three in the morning. And get someone out of bed to tell them that a child had died in a car accident. Or a husband had died in a murder. Or someone out of town had died in the police department, had been asked to notify the family. You've heard it said, don't commit murder. But then Jesus adds this community language. But I say to you, and listen close, don't even be angry with your brother. You see, in Jesus' eyes, this community is so different that anger is as ugly as murder. We are a community that must, if we claim Christ as our Savior, be willing to forgive one another. Jesus said, I'll build a church on this belief. The Old Testament tells us in the law there is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And we quote that quite often. We quote it to justify all sorts of punishment. Punishment should be harsh. Punishment should be quick. But it was written in the Old Testament to limit punishment so that there be no revenge. Punish no more than one has suffered. What did Jesus say? You have heard that it's said, an eye for an eye. But Jesus would say, turn the other cheek. Don't even look for equal justice with one another. You see, the bottom line is when we join the church, we enter a community. And we'll go back to something I said last week. We are called to be different. And I think a lot of us go into the area we think we're being different when we're just going with the stream. You see, the church today and over the next few months and years is going to face a lot of places. We'll have to make decisions as individuals and maybe sometimes as a church. We'll face the challenge, and have to have biblical answers for same-sex marriage. 
We're going to face the challenge soon in our state, as it has been in many states, of legalized marijuana. What will the church say? And I'm not proposing an answer right now. I'm just asking this question. Will we say, I believe in Christ, and I want to know what he teaches? I want to know what his lifestyle would say. I want to know where forgiveness would take me, love would take me, if I'm really different. Young people face the challenge every day of desiring to fit in and, and going the easy route, which in reality betrays Christ. Adults face the challenge every day of going the easy route, which betrays Christ. But Christ said to us, to Boone's Creek Christian Church, let's make it personal, you are the called out. You are to be different. Guys, you are to be a man's man. Ladies, you are to represent the feminine aspects of God that says to the world there's hope in this community. There's love in this community. It's a very touching story told of a lady named Florence Dace. I fact-checked it and read about it. It's a very moving story. Her husband and she were members, active members of Southside Christian Church in Springfield, Illinois. I've had opportunity to worship at that church a couple of times. I was at a Bible study one day and left to work on an apartment that he was remodeling. Two or three other guys were there working and Tom Dace on that morning started a power saw. Saw woke a man up upstairs that had been drinking, was laying, nearly passed out. And in his drunken anger, he attacked Tom Dace with a hammer, a claw hammer, and killed him. Strong Christian, mid-morning, Saturday, and for no reason he's killed. Tom's wife is named Florence. She went to the county jail and they allowed her to meet this man. She said to him, you've taken my husband, you've taken my partner, you've taken my security. And then she said, here's Frank's Bible. With all you've taken from me, the least you can do is take my husband's Bible and read it. Quote, you owe it to me to read it. Tom Dace had written in his own hand how you become a Christian in the front of the Bible. And it didn't happen immediately, but over a period of time in reading that Bible, Frank, who had murdered him, became a Christian. And then entered into a long life in prison came time for him to be paroled. And Florence Dace, the widow, went and spoke to the parole board. And she said, I don't think he's an evil man now. He's a forgiven man. Killed my husband. But I think society would be best served if he was paroled. He'd already started a prison ministry. And when he was released from prison, he began to visit other prisons in Illinois and the ministry grew and became very active. And he worked in that prison ministry until his death in 2002. Now here's my question. Was she different from the rest of the world? Called out to be different. There's people that will wait to ambush you in their anger, in their bitterness. Christians should never be that way. And I got news for you. We'll disappoint each other. We'll hurt each other. We'll say stupid, mean, meaningless things to each other. Not even aware we're doing it most of the time. But the community forgives. And it's almost embarrassing to say that because that's Christianity 101. What do we do for the rest of the world? 
I have this dream. Uh, it, it, it's been a dream for a long time. I, I maybe told you when I entered ministry, I had a dream that just seemed totally, totally unavailable to this kid coming out of Westside Christian Church in Elizabethan and going up Stony Creek to a church of 40 people for his first ministry. Dumber than dirt. I, I remember working on the first sermon, and it was fabulous, and I preached it, and I'd worked hours on it, and I remember panic setting in that afternoon when I realized I've got to do that again next week, and I've said everything I know to say. <laughs> and then Jill reminded me there's an evening service. And I said, well, we need to have a singspiration. <laughs> but the goal that was in my heart was I wanted to say before I died, I had baptized a thousand people into Christ. I think it'll happen. But wouldn't you love to see this church with a thousand people in worship? It's just a round number. I want to tell you something. With the number of people that will be here today, how many of you would like to see that? You know? Now let me tell you something. If the community ecclesia that Jesus talked about got real busy, that would happen next week. Wouldn't it? If we said, I'm going to go to someone in my family, my neighbor, my friend, and say, Will you worship with me next week? And then I'll take you out to eat. It would happen. So the question come, becomes, how much do we believe in that rock called Jesus? How much as a body of believers? See, that's the community we're called to be a part of. One that has as its marks acceptance, one that has as its mark peace. One that has as its mark joy and hope. One that has as its mark growth. I want everybody, um, if you will, to turn to Mark. Gospel of Mark. The third chapter. And I want us to read verses 32 through 35 with this phrase, that's the church. I want you to listen to it. I, I'll start with verse 31. Preachers always do that, give you one, then say, let's start earlier. Okay. Jesus was teaching, talking in parables. People were listening. And then it says in verse 31, then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Now this is Mary and James and many others of the family we've never met. And it says, standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. You see, they thought he was crazy. They were not real sure about him. They were worried about him. And so the whole family shows up and says, tell him to get out here. It says in verse 32, a crowd was sitting around him and they told him, your mothers and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mothers and brothers, he asked. And then he answered this question. This is church. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mothers and brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister and my mother. Whoever does God's will is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Called out. Ecclesia. Bottom line is when we join the church, we enter into community. Are you part of that community? I looked. I thought about it. The mills at the church that we have, a community. Very close friends, Brenda and Bob Farrar. Bob was a very close friend. and Bob, when he was 52, had a heart attack. Or when he was 50, had a heart attack and died. 
Brenda knew of my father's death at age 50. Brenda was very active in her church, and she'd heard me mention that before, but it never clicked, and suddenly her husband died, and we were talking about it one day, and there were tears, and she said, your dad was 50. I said, yeah. She said, could I speak to your mom? Mom, 18 or 20 years old. My mom came to see us a few weeks later in Florida, and I told her Brenda's request said she'd be happy to do it, and Brenda came and picked Mom up at 11.45 for a 12 o'clock lunch appointment. They came home at 4.30. That's the church. Sunday school class. A Sunday morning small group learns of a need. And money is collected from individuals' po pockets to meet that need. That's community. That's the church. You go by the hospital and there's a room at the hospital full of not family, but of church family. People from Sunday school class, people from small groups, people from acquaintances in the church, and they're praying together. And then there's laughter and shared food and joy and anticipation. And what would have taken an hours seems to take much less time. That's the church. There's a critic or an unforgiving person, a gossip. They're tolerated, tolerated. I'll tell you a real quick story. The man who belittled the church every breath told everybody what was wrong with the church years ago, and he finally left the church and made his grand climactic criticism and in that said, people in the church aren't real smart. He said, let me tell you something. That pushed me over the edge. I said, let me tell you something. What you've called Christian ignorance has been the Holy Spirit's patience with you. That's the church. Patience. Prayer. A young couple announces to their small group on a Sunday morning in class or during the week when that group is meeting that they're expecting and was shot by a friendly. And they didn't know how bad it was, only that it was horrible. Jill and I went by their home that evening. And when we arrived, we had to look for a parking place. And I assumed there would be a lot of people there to meet that I didn't know. But when Jill and I walked in that home, it was full of men and women from this church and their small group that had gone to sit with them and brought meals and desserts and the whole nine yards while they awaited the phone call. That's intimate fellowship. Fellowship that's known as the church. How'd the story end about Emily? Is there any way the church can serve you at this time? Your daughter's going to die in six weeks. You've asked me to pray. He says the father responded as Bill Heibel told the story. Bill, we're okay. Really, we are. We're in a loving small group in the church. We've been in it for several years now. And our group members knew that this pregnancy had complications. They were at our house the night we learned the news about Emily. They were at the hospital when she was delivered. And they stood beside us and helped us to absorb the reality of the whole thing. They even cleaned our house and fixed our meals when we brought her home. They pray for us constantly, and they call us several times each day. They're even helping us plan Emily's funeral. Three other couples then stepped forward and surrounded Emily and her parents. And one of them said, we always attend church together as a group. Hybels wrote these words. 
this was a picture that I will carry to my grave, a tight-knit huddle of loving brothers and sisters doing their best to soften one of life's cruelest blows. And after a group prayer, they all walked up the side aisle toward the lobby, big word, together. Where, I wondered as they left, would that family be? Where would they go? How would they handle this heartbreak without the church? We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fail each other. Right? But Christ didn't. Christ didn't. And we get to serve each other. And we get to forgive each other. And that takes a group and does this. You remember as a child learning, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door, and there's all the people. Forget it. Here's the church. It's the people who believe that Jesus is the Son of God and live it out every day of their lives looking to serve other people as best we can. You're the church. Let's pray. God, thank you that you allow us to even know your name. But you did. Thank you, God, that you even allow us to believe in you. But you did. And thank you, God, that you would allow us to speak the word forgiveness, that you forgave. Father, we want to be like you. We'll mess up at times. We'll make mistakes. But God, we humbly pray today that you'll forgive us. That we'll be people who know your word, people who know the power of your community, not of ours. But if your community is the Holy Spirit lives in all of us. Father, this day is yours. We rejoice in it. And we pray this in the precious name of Christ. Amen. We're going to stand and if there's decision that needs to be made this morning, reference to the church.